Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. We're very glad you could join us. My name is Billy Carson. I'm with University Conference Services. Before we get started, I'd like to give you some general information about today's, uh, this afternoon's presentation. Let's just get to the next slide here. There we go. Uh, first, we have a large audience, so we won't be able to open the phone lines for your questions. But you can, at, you can type them in the questions pane, which is on the control panel, and that's on the right side of your screen. Your questions are private. They aren't visible to other audience members, so please feel free to ask whatever questions you like. Our speaker will answer as many as time permits at the conclusion of the presentation. Next, if you're listening to the broadcast over your computer and you're having difficulty hearing, dial into the number listed in the audio pane, and again, that's in your control panel. We've also set that number out via chat. Finally, we're recording this broadcast, and we'll make the link available to you via email. We'll also send out information on HRCI recertification credit, and you can expect to receive that from us sometime tomorrow. Uh, I wanted to let you know, too, that our speaker has very kindly agreed to make his slides available to you within the next couple of days. So uh, that's all the announcements out of the way. Uh, today's presentation is, If I Were in Your Shoes, Best Practices for Running a Successful and Compliant Retirement Plan. That's an intriguing title on a very important topic. Our speaker today, Adam Sakalik, is going to share his expertise on the matter. Adam is Senior Vice President of Retirement Partners for LPL Financial, where he has varied responsibilities, including leading all technology and strategic planning efforts for the Retirement Partners Group. This team of advisors assists plan sponsors in creating effective retirement plans based on sound fiduciary principles. Adam also has responsibility for the creation and day-to-day -day management of the LPL financial worksite solution, SYNC. SYNC is a suite of services specifically developed to address the financial wellness of employees and to help them gain confidence in their financial lives. Adam holds a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting from the Pennsylvania State University, and he also holds the FINRA Series 6 and 63 li uh, licenses. And now I'm going to turn things over to Adam. And Adam, I'm giving you control now. You should be able to show your desktop and move your slides. Great. Thanks, Billy. I appreciate that. And Billy, just confirm for me you can see the presentation. I definitely can. Perfect. All right. Um, so thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join us today. Um, I'm pretty excited to talk about this topic. It's something near and dear to my heart. Um, and we are going to discuss some pretty weighty topics uh, around employee benefits, including the risks that you are taking as an employer just by sponsoring a 401k plan. Uh, the topics are important, they're heavy, and they are pretty serious. Uh, but I really don't want you to feel like a former mob boss uh, just as this dement check is pulling up. Um, because as we learn about these risks inherent in sponsoring a retirement plan, we'll also discuss strategies that you can use to manage those risks. Uh, the first step in alleviating the worry around the topic is really to gather information and then from there, you can start to make informed decisions about how to move forward. And really, that's why we're all here today. So we're going to cover the subject in five parts. And we'll include some critical takeaways for you that you can act on right away where appropriate, you know, based on your business and where you are. And these broad topics that we're going to cover, you know, first we're going to talk about why do you have a benefit plan in the first place? Who are the employees you're trying to support? Are the benefits you have really a good match for that employee base? And then how much risk are you really willing to take and how much are you actually taking? Uh, and then the last thing we're going to talk about are what are some of the ways you can manage that risk or, you know, if it is a risk, at least make it less risky. So with that, let's jump in and go ahead and get started. Um, so the question is, you know, why do you have benefits? And it might seem obvious uh, or it might seem frivolous, but the truth is that the motiva motivation behind offering benefits to employees really does play a key role in how you handle them. It impacts how your employees view your company how you're effectively spending your money, and then the quality of life your employees have. Uh, so really, this is a key question you need to answer, and one that reaches the very heart of your business, at least assuming your business has employees and that you're not uh, coming from a self-employment uh, perspective. So here's a line that we'll call the motivation range, and the point all the way over to the left we'll call us, and then the point over to the right we can call them. If the reason you're offering benefits is solely about your highly compensated employees, like the business owner and his or her family, you might visualize yourself close to that point on the left-hand side of the screen. And really, there's nothing wrong with that. When you put a benefit program in place, you're usually also benefiting anyone else who works with you. So although it may be to a lesser degree, 
you're still providing jobs and some level of benefits for others, along with providing for your current and future needs as the business owner. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, all the way to the right, is a point we call them. And this is where you might fall if your motivation for implementing a benefits program is really more paternalistic. You know, we've heard employers say things like, if I don't provide a retirement plan for my employees, they won't save at all, or my employees won't buy health insurance on their own, so I just do it for them. And again, there's nothing wrong with this end of the spectrum. Uh, it, again, it benefits everyone to some degree because even the highly paid and executive staff are going to have access to the same benefits that are provided to all employees. And the reality is most firms and most people fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, maybe the goals of your plans and the goals of your company overlap. For example, you put in a particularly generous health insurance program because you recognize the company down the street was pilfering your employees simply by offering a better deal for them. Or perhaps the founder of your company is beginning to think about retiring and he needs to beef up his retirement income a little bit, so you add some different investment options and features to your 401k plan that may make it easier for him to contribute more. So that does benefit the owner, but it also benefits everyone else who works there. And so as I mentioned when we first kicked it off, one of the key things you have to understand is who are your employees. So let's talk a little bit about your workforce. So when you start to examine your workforce demographics, you can really identify some of the benefits that will be most important to them. You can also identify some of the tactics that will be most effective when you're explaining the benefits. Patterns will end up emerging from this kind of analysis that make it easier to decide whether or not you have the right package in place. As you break employees down by age, gender, full or part-time status, type of job, educational level, and any other differentiators you can think of. You know, as a side note, you definitely want to pay attention to gender and age patterns because it can really help you making hiring decisions that are in line with equity rules as well if you're required to meet any. So let's break this down into two parts. The employees you have and then the employees you want. For current employees, who are they? Are they mainly young, inexperienced, just starting out? Or do you experience a lot of turnover? Do you feel like you're training employees just for their next employer because they stay with you just long enough to learn some things and then move on? Or maybe your employees are mostly mid-career professionals. They come to you with already established careers. Did they start with you when they were at the beginning of their career and then stayed, stayed on with you for years? Do they tend to be single or have families to care for? These are all things that you want to think about. And now, think about the employees you'd like to have. If those if those employees you'd like to have match the ones you want, then things are going good. You're probably doing a good job of identifying quality candidates and then incentivizing them to come aboard and giving them what they need and want in order to stay with you. Uh, just one thing I'd point out, we'll talk more about this later, but remember that salary is only one component of an effective reward structure. Benefits, in fact, are going to be really critical as well. And so it's important to understand how well the benefits you provide match up to the needs and wants of your workforce. Why, you may ask? Well, to answer that question, let's talk a little bit more about why you have benefits at all. If you offer benefits in order to attract and keep the right employees, you have to understand what those employees really value. So let's say, for an example, your goal is a stable, mid-career workforce. People who have some years of experience and who can immediately make a contribution to your team, you should realize that they're likely thinking about paying for a suburban lifestyle, maybe funding college for a couple of kids, feeling secure that they have good health insurance, not to mention looking into their own future retirement. If you're spending your benefits budget on bare bones insurance coverage and Friday evening pizza and ping pong matches, you're probably not using that budget to, the, to its full advantage. On the other hand, if you hire young or inexperienced people because you know that the jobs you're offering are probably only a way to help them pay their tuition, you may be overdoing it by paying for a Cadillac health insurance. So you might want to consider those Friday night pizza parties and ping pong matches, as in that case, not only will the employee contribute to building, team building and fun, but it's something that young people probably will value a bit more than they do insurance. It's even more important to realize that the recession has potentially left its mark on all employees. You know, while some, some younger employees were less likely to have skin in the game in the form of big 401k balances, their jobs may have seemed significantly less stable than those who were of their older coworkers. And the recession era may not may seem short to those of us who fall into the baby boomer or even the Gen X category, potentially representing just a fraction of our working lives. But to someone whose career was only a few years old in 2007, the majority of their working life may have been spent under a recessionary shadow. So what are your employees' value? Right, That's the question. Well, according to a recent study by MetLife, uh, it's their MetLife's 10th annual study of employee benefits trends. Uh, it was done in 2012. The answer really depends on which generational category they occupy. 
the study is also pretty interesting in that it shows the way that an employer perceives their benefits and what value and loyalty they believe they're generating versus what the employees actually believe. And it's interesting because in many cases it's actually pretty different. Um, so let's take a look at some examples from the chart that's on the screen. You know, among small employers, those with between two and 499 employees, which was the purpose of the study, MetLife found that many of their employers discount the impact of non-medical insurance benefits, like life, dental, and disability insurance, have in actually driving employee loyalty. In fact, just 29% of employers said that those benefits are an important factor for employees. Yet, when MetLife surveyed those employees, 44% said those offerings actually help to drive loyalty, their loyalty. And everyone agrees that health insurance and salary play a key role in driving loyalty. The variation between the employer and employees is much smaller in those areas. But another surprising result is when you look at retirement benefits. Here, 35% of employers believe their retirement plan improves employee loyalty, but 52% of employees said the same. So voluntary benefits, those that can be purchased by the employee at the workplace, also can make a huge difference. 38% of employees said having the opportunity to buy voluntary benefits is a driver of loyalty, while only 20% of employers thought so. So we determined that your employees may be likely to value health insurance, voluntary benefits, and retirement plans. And if a close examination of your workforce has shown that your employees are mostly young, single, and without families, you may be able to address those needs with a high deductible health plan and an accompanying health savings account, along with a menu of voluntary coverages that they can purchase at their discretion. Of course, sponsoring a 401k plan to which they can contribute if they want to make the package even more attractive may also be a great way to go. Employees who are a little older and have more responsibilities may be more likely to appreciate a health insurance plan that pays for a few doctor visits each year without a deductible, an accompanying health savings plan for the big stuff, and a 401k plan that is a little more fancy, maybe including some more variety in investment options and even a matching contribution from the company. These employees, too, may appreciate the availability of voluntary benefits so they can purchase life insurance or disability insurance above and beyond what you're already providing. You know, among the small business employees surveyed for the MetLife study, a whopping 72% said they're interested in an employer-provided financial education program, yet only 29% of their employers reported offering one. Financial education can be a critical factor in employee wellness, something that employers understand that may be important in maintaining employee productivity and seeking to reduce health care costs as well. And we're going to spend some more time on this later in the conversation. So here's our first takeaway. Make sure you know why you're offering an employee benefit plan and that it does what you want it to do. Otherwise, you're just wasting your money. Offering employee benefits is a sign that you care about your employees and your business. But there are risks associated with some offerings that you need to know about. You've probably heard the word fiduciary a lot lately, but you may not be entirely clear on what the word really means. So fiduciary refers to a relationship involving trust, especially when there's money involved. In the case of retirement plans, fiduciaries have the responsibility to protect the money over which they have authority. And anyone who makes a decision for the plan, whether it's the plan administrator, an administrative or investment committee members, or even the owner of a company, are all fiduciaries, even if they're not officially named as such. And so a functional fiduciary is one who is not named, but who is performing the duties of a fiduciary and who has decision-making discretion over the plan or its assets. When there's a committee formed to oversee the plan, each participant on the committee becomes a plan fiduciary. And so really, what does this mean for to you? Well, it means that you can be held personally liable for the losses of the plan, even if you're not the one who made the decision that results in the loss. And that's because fiduciaries are jointly liable for decisions made by themselves and other fiduciaries. So for example, if you're on the plan committee and one or more of the members of the committee do, does something illegal or ill-advised, all members of that committee can be held financially responsible with their own personal assets at stake. And in the worst cases, you can even be held criminally liable. So, I mean, we're talking about jail here. Uh, so consider this, this slide is really just another critical takeaway. Um, and then I want to spend the next few minutes kind of talking about a few examples of fiduciary risk that is business owners or managers sometimes can end up taking without even realizing it. And so here we have Alice. And Alice is you know, a, a small business owner. She has a small business. She has a 401k plan. And her brother happens to be a financial advisor. Uh, so Alice decides that she wants to help him out and get him started advising retirement plans. So Alice selects her brother 
as the plan, plans advisor without really talking to anyone or without following the written selection process. Then we have Maria. And so Maria, in general, isn't worried about investment returns. You know, after all, in her mind, you know, employees are adults and they can make their own decisions. She works for a company that offers a 401k plan. She sits on the plan committee and she performs all the administrative duties of the plan, integrating with the payroll company, things like that. Um, and again, because you know she feels her employees are free to enroll or not enroll, and choose their own investments, she figures that she and the company are not really responsible for the poor investment returns the participant may have experienced. And then we have Tom, and so Tom's on the plan's investment committee. Seven or eight years ago, the committee adopted an investment policy statement. Since then, employees and committee members have turned over. So Tom has made the most of the choices of the plan. He considers himself a savvy investor, and when he spots something with potential, he makes a quick call and adds it to the lineup. He thinks because his choices have all made you know, re great gains in recent months, he believes he's doing a great job and has really done right by the participants in the plan. And so, to be clear, each of these, each of these three, Tom, Maria, and Alice, is an example of what not to do. By understanding what it means to be a plan fiduciary, you can easily identify the problem in each situation. The main principle to remember is this, a plan fiduciary has a responsibility to act in the sole interest of the plan's participants and beneficiaries. So let's kind of dig into each of those examples and see where each of them went wrong. So when we take a look at Alice, really her errors were around a lack of guidance, a due diligence and creation, uh, and really the due diligence and the following of a process. You know, she failed to realize the seriousness of the decision she was undertaking. And so the critical takeaway here is that the process is really more important than the outcome. For Maria, you know, she had a failure to really review the investment options, or in this example, really anything else. And she had a failure to recognize her own shortcomings. Right? She said she wasn't an investment ex expert. It wasn't what she did. Um, so the critical takeaway here is that as a fiduciary, you have to acknowledge your own shortcomings or the shortcomings of that, those of the committee and then engage a proper specialist to help you overcome that. And then we have Tom. You know, Tom was really taking some excessive risk due to a lack of, or really a lack of following an investment policy statement. Um, so while, you know, kind of jumping back to Alice, you know, why her brother may have been a fine investment advisor, how does Alice know? You know, in fact, she's really gambling with the participant's money uh, on her brother's abilities. What should she have done? She and the other fiduciary should have sought guidance from a qualified professional who could help them create a checklist of requirements for a plan advisor, much like they might do when conducting an employee search. It could include questions like, how long have you been in the investment advisory business? How many plans do you work with? How much do they have in assets? Do you work with businesses that are similar in size and industry to ours? The point is that the selection of an investment advisor must be deliberate and it must be documented. All of the information associated with making of the choice should then be stored so that it can be presented in a case should there be any future problems, like an employee claim or Department of Labor audit. And here's another really important takeaway. The outcome may not be as important as the process. If your processes are well-crafted, thoroughly documented, and completely followed, accounts may still lose money, but that may not, that won't get the fiduciaries in legal hot water, but failing to have a process or failing to follow the process may. And so looking at Maria, she was correct in that employees at her company are free to enroll or not and to choose for themselves among the investments offered. But a 401k plan should not be left on autopilot. The plan fiduciary bears responsibility if the investment options they selected are performing poorly but have not been periodically reviewed and replaced as needed. Fiduciaries should perform a review of the investments at least once every two or three quarters to make sure that the available investments meet the ongoing needs of the participants. Now, of course, Marie and her colleagues are unlikely to have the expertise needed to perform this kind of review, and that's why it's important they utilize the services of a qualified professional who can guide them through that process. In fact, they didn't, that in and of itself is a fiduciary duty. And another important point I'd like you to take away from today is that you got to recognize where your own expertise is lacking and hire someone who possesses it. And so now we're going to switch gears to Tom, and while he can make any decision, any decision that he would like for his own personal investment portfolio, he's really not free to do so with the investments available in the 401k plan. He's really taking more risk than is prudent, something plan fiduciaries must avoid. And this is another case where periodic investment reviews would be wise. The decisions Tom is making have not been documented, they're not following an investment follow the investment policy statement, and in fact, no one has even looked at their investment policy statement in years. And so all of these conditions can be trouble for Tom and for the plan. 
there are some overriding principles that we can pull out of these three examples. You know, if you have any decision-making discretion over the plan or its assets, you are a fiduciary, whether or not you're named as such. And as a fiduciary, you have a responsible responsibility to see that the plan operates solely in the best interest of the participants and beneficiaries at all times, and even by other fiduciaries. Your own personal assets are going to be at stake, so you must be aware of the risks you assume as a fiduciary. And all decisions should be deliberate and documented, and you have to recognize your own limitations. So now I would just ask you, can you feel that cement truck backing up? Well, I don't want you to worry too much about it. It's not too late to scramble out of the hole. So let's just talk, spend a few minutes talking about how you can manage the risks as a sponsor or a fiduciary of a qualified retirement plan. You know, in our earlier examples, you may have noted something was missing. In each case, the plan fiduciaries did not avail themselves of the many expert resources available to them. As a plan fiduciary, it's very important that you recognize your own limitations as well as the limitations of your co-fiduciaries. The law does not expect you to become an expert in retirement plans and investments, but it does expect you to acknowledge your deficiencies and fill them with someone who is an expert. In fact, you may violate what's known as the prudent person rule if you fail to hire an expert when an expert is really needed. Don't imagine though that you can just blindly follow the experts you've chosen. As a fiduciary, you're required to monitor the expert's commission of his or her duties. To provide expert insight on the plan's investments, you may decide to hire a retirement plan advisor. And there are a number of different industry credentials out there and designations that an advisor may bring. And it, it would likely benefit you to learn a little bit more about education and training required for them. But for now, we'll discuss advisors who are designated as a 321 or a 338 fiduciary. Both of these kinds of advisors assume, in writing, a level of fiduciary responsibility they share with you and other fiduciaries of the plan. They're both required to observe the prudent person rule and to make decisions based solely on the interests of the participants and beneficiaries of the plan, just as you are. And the main difference between a 321 and a 328 fiduciary is that the 321 fiduciary will advise you about choosing and replacement investments, and the 338 will assume that responsibility of selecting, monitoring, and making the actual changes to the investment lineup, removing that particular responsibility from you. In either case, as a plan fiduciary, you're, responsibility, you're responsible for overseeing these experts, monitoring their activities, and making sure they are providing accurate and thorough documentation of their decisions. Even if you move the investment fiduciary responsibility to a 338 advisor, you retain the responsibility to examine his or her progress and make sure he or she is doing the job right. Remember that documentation, whether it covers decisions you make or your 338 fiduciary advisor makes, is one of the most critical things you'll possess in the invest in the event of an audit or a participant action. And so when you hire an advisor, it's important to learn about the resources that support him or her. The advisor you choose should have the tools and the ability to make a real difference for the plan and ultimately the participants. LPL advisors have access to a complete suite of tools that we call worksite financial solutions that really provide help when it's needed the most. You know, earlier we talked about the importance of financial education, the overall health and productivity of employees and that the fact that they really want and need this education and even advice. The Worksite Financial Solution tools include a, a series of components, one of which is called the Employee Advice Solution and the other is called Employee Education Solution. The Employee Education Solution is a four-step process that seeks to improve the financial well-being of your employees. So step one is an assessment of each employee's concerns and overall financial wellness. Once those issues are known, step two delivers a collection of education modules to address those concerns. And then step three helps you market that program to your employees, providing materials to encourage participation. The final step is then actually tracking the program's results and outcomes so you can actually see improvement either from the one in installation or year over year as you adopt the program. With the employee advice solution, employees can access individual personalized advice from their LPL financial advisor. Some employees may not want to invest on their own or may not feel confident that they're on track for retirement. And I would submit to you, if you've ever been part of a 401k enrollment meeting, often after those meetings, the employee will go up to the enroller and say, okay, I don't know what to do, can you do it for me? And in general, the enroller has to say no, because they're not allowed. Uh, this solution overcomes that objective. And so with Worksite Financial Solutions and the Advice Solution, employees are able to get unbiased advice that they can access in a variety of ways, online, face-to-face, -face, or over the phone. And most importantly, they get professional management and monitoring of their investments as well as reports showing them what they need to do to stay on track. Another component of the program is what we call the Employee Transition Solution. 
And so really what this is, it's a way to assist employees as they move to another employer. So they're leaving your firm, they're going somewhere else. As you can all imagine, that sort of transition is really a time of change and upheaval with an employee. And a lot of times they have no idea what to do with their existing 401k balance. This program allows the employee to get unbiased education from a licensed financial advisor on what their options are to do with that money, whether it's to leave it in your plan, take the cash distribution and buy the bass boat, roll it to the newer employer plan, or open up an IRA. The last component of the program of Worksite Financial Solution is what we call employee engagement. And the employee engagement solution, the goal of that is to talk to every new employee that you were to bring into your firm, actually help facilitate getting them enrolled in the plan, and then help them consolidate any outside assets they have. So just in that last example, if, if you hire a new employee and they came from another employer that had a 401k plan, likely they left their money there. So now they can, they can be helped to move that money into your plan so they can manage all their investments in one place and really help to start addressing their overall financial goals. And so the Worksite Financial Solutions tools really will assist your L, an LPL advisor in providing leading services for their retirement plan clients. You know, these tools, they lead the industry and really help make a real difference for employees. And really, that's the bottom line for any plan fiduciary. And one more thing you're going to want to take away. The tools and experience of your retirement plan advisor can help you manage your fiduciary risks. So as we've seen, I think I've talked long enough now, um, straight through. So it's, it, things are more involved in being a plan fiduciary than just signing, signing the plan document. Fiduciaries have a responsibility to help employees make good decisions, and we hope that I hope that the information that I presented today has really given you some things to think about. Uh, so, Billy, with that, that's kind of all my prepared remarks. If you want to start feeding any questions that may have come through uh, while I was chatting, that'd be great. Okay, we do have a couple questions here. Um, you mentioned that employees are being financially stressed. Why do you think that's something employers should be thinking about? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Billy. Um, there's a lot of statistics out there to talk about it, but I think there's, there's a couple of main reasons why employees being financially stressed is, is something employers should think about. Um, the first is there's actually, I have a survey done by Financial Finesse that was done about two years ago, and what they found when they surveyed a Fortune 1000 company around their employees' financial wellness is that financially stressed employees actually were driving up the health care costs of that company upwards of 24%. So one main reason is you have an ability to, to significantly lower your health care costs. The reason for that being driven up is that financial stress is actually the number one cause of stress-related illness uh, out in the American workforce today. So things like migraines and headaches and things like that, uh, a huge issue. Uh, another reason I think employers really want to think about overall financial wellness is that I think, you know, and you can relate it back to yourself, right? I mean, we all know that there are times when we're sitting at our desk and if you know there's something going on on our personal life if we're thinking about okay how are we going to pay the mortgage how are we going how am i going to send my kid to college we're spending time at work thinking about those things and not being productive not doing the things we need to do to be a good em employee for the company uh, so those are just a couple of the reasons i would also submit to you that another big issue with financial wellness is that because folks just aren't saving enough for retirement you know, they're staying in the workforce a lot longer, and so they're not, they're not moving on. So not only is that driving up your health care costs because you may have older employees, what I think is a bigger issue is that the employees who are a little bit younger are hitting a ceiling because the person in front of them is still there and maybe really shouldn't be. Uh, so you end up losing that younger talent because they're going to look elsewhere for that next step in their career. So I think to me all that kind of ties back to financial wellness and really why I think it's so important for employers to start thinking about that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we have one here. Um, this is a little, I hadn't thought about this before, but can fiduciary liability be passed down to someone else when the person who made the decision leaves the company, or does the person who made the decisions retain fiduciary liability even after that person has left That's and a is great. no longer employed by that company? That's a great question and one that I also have not given a lot of thought of. Um, so I, am, I am not an attorney, so let me say that flat out. So, you know, I'll answer the question, but know that I'm not 100% on the answer. But I actually do think once that person is no longer on the committee and no longer responsible for the decision, it does fall back to the committee. I think the thing to remember is that if there's five people on a committee, you're all responsible for that decision, whether you personally made it or not. 
So even if that person is not there, the committee, you know, in essence, is still responsible. Does that make sense, Billy? Does that, do you think that answers the question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, um, we have another one here. We hear a lot about retirement readiness these days. I'm not sure I understand how focusing on that will help reduce my fiduciary liabilities. Um, can you elaborate? Sure, uh, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I mean, retirement readiness, you know, from my perspective is really, it's become this new buzzword out in the industry. Uh, there's been a dramatic shift, especially, you know, in the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, where those companies are starting to focus on you know, actually helping the employees retire, right? If you think about the main purpose of a 401k plan specifically, the main goal of that plan should be to help those people retire, right? So it's not about participation rate and savings rate and things like that. It's about getting those people to retirement. And I think in general, the industry hasn't done a great job in focusing on that over the last 15, 20 years. It's all been about, well, let's get people enrolled and let's get them saving at, you know, 3%, 4%, 5%. Well, the reality is what we're seeing now is that that's just simply not enough. Uh, in fact, even today, like I was just reading an article, and so I'm going to read a stat that I have up on my screen here, but it, there was a, a recent survey done from the Employee Benefit Research Institute, uh, EBRI for short. Um, it's called their Annual Retirement Confidence, Confidence Survey, and it was released in March. And what they found is that actually only 66% of individuals and or their spouses have even begun saving for retirement. 57% have less than $25,000 saved, and 28% have less than $1,000 saved. Like, to me, that just goes to show you how, what kind of retirement epidemic we really have in this country. And so by, by switching the mentality a little bit from a plan sponsor perspective and really starting to think about, okay, how do I get my employees to retirement? What are the, what are the tools I need to deliver to them to make that happen? And how do I get them to, to save more money and start investing earlier? You know, those are key things that need to be thought about. And that's why I think retirement readiness, I just think, is so important. And it's going to be the future. And if you... You know, if you ever were to get an audit from the DOL or, um, you know, a participant action, and they were to come in and you can justify and you can document that says, look, you know, our goal for the retirement plan was to help people to, to retire, and that, that's, that was the basis for every decision we made, I think you're going to be in a pretty good defendable position, regardless of what had happened to cause that event. Uh, anyway, I know I just rambled on for that question. Sorry. <laughs> I get on a soapbox no, a little I bit when it comes to that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> Well, uh, we, we've heard those sorts of arguments before, and I think it was well stated. Uh, we've got another one here. Where do you see the employer's role as a fiduciary making plan decisions to offer and where to set auto-enrollment levels and setting limits on auto-increase provisions? You know, that's so, again, that's a, that's a really timely question. Literally, but right before I got on this call, I was reading this long article about uh, retirement readiness, and, and that specific question was a, was a big topic in that article. You know, I think today most plan sponsors, if they have auto enrollment, they set it at 3% with a 1% increase. I would submit to you that that is not nearly enough. Uh, my two cents is you should set auto enrollment at 6% with 2% annual increases. What we've seen in all the research that I've read and the research we've done is that moving that initial increase from uh, the initial sign up from 3% to 6%, you're not going to lose anybody. People aren't going to opt out. The reality is they need us to do it for them because they're not doing it themselves. And the problem is, you know, when you when you do an auto increase at one percent, you're not moving the move you're not moving the needle quick enough. The reality is most people need to be saving somewhere between ten to fifteen percent of their annual income to actually be able to, to get to the retirement goal, assuming we're saying the retirement goal is, you know, an eighty percent replacement ratio. In order to get there, starting at three and going one, 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 you're not gonna do it. Starting at 6, going to 8, going to 10, going to 12, that gets you to where the employee needs to be. Um, you know, and as far as the fiduciary aspect of it, you know, setting things up to be auto-enrollment, auto-escalation, a lot of that is sort of, you know, if you, if you do it with a QDIA option, you're really in a safe harbor position. Um, you know, and it's definitely something that's is getting a ton of traction. I think, again, this article I read today it said something like uh, on the – uh, non-profit side, you know, the auto enrollment, auto escalation really has been lagging. It's something like, you know, 20% of the plans Fidelity has on the non-profit side have that feature. But on the corporate side, it's over 50%. I think the number was 57%. Uh, so it's really starting to gain traction. And I would say if you haven't looked at it and you haven't thought to your retirement plan advisor about it, um, I definitely would. Um, I definitely think, you know, plan design options like that are a really a great way to help get employees to that end, end goal. 
Okay, thank you. You know, we have seen that among our audience uh, attendees at our conferences. Uh, there is a trend towards the auto features, and it's been um, most of the providers out there will tell you that uh, there's been a, a, a good take up on that. Um, and your point about the um, percentage that people need to set aside for retirement annually, that's mm -hmm. something I would say that's fairly recent in the retirement, uh, the employer-sponsored retirement arena. It wasn't until the last few years that we began hearing those sorts of percentages, and I think it can be a, a little shocking to participants to understand that they're going to have yeah. to put away maybe 15 percent of their of their income. So, yeah, no, um, it is, and had, it is, uh, and I would just say, you know, ability to add on to that, I, mean, I just think it, 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 the industry in general has been doing a disservice by not telling them what the reality is, right? And I think it's sort of oh, gotten absolutely. us to where we are today. And, the, you know, the recession, the, the Great Recession, really amplified that. You know, when you get someone who's 55 to 60 years old and they lost, you know, 40% of their income, I mean, that's a real eye-opener, right? And now those people have to rebuild. And many of them have, but, you know, I don't know that they've, they ever got to the point even before the recession where they were in the, in, in the, in the spot to actually replace 80% of their income. And, you know, it's gotten worse, right, as, we, as the country has moved away from DB plans and more and more of that responsibility has fallen back on the individual. The individuals just aren't in a position to really do it on their own, right? They don't, they don't have enough knowledge. They don't have the investment expertise. Um, and so it really now is, I think, the industry is finally starting to come around to talk about the things and, you know, share the reality of where people are. Uh, and it's not about, you know, hitting them over the head with a two-by-four, uh, which I do think is a powerful motivator. It's not about that, but if, you know, if someone doesn't know really what their end result needs to be, they're never going to get there. That's right. We have a couple of more questions here. I want to make sure we get to them. Um, can fiduciaries, uh, this is a, a hot issue right now, can fiduciaries uh, re-enroll employees into target date funds? Uh, I know that's been discussed a number of times. Yeah, you absolutely can. So you can do, if you have an auto-enrollment feature in your plan, you can do a re-enrollment and re-enroll those who aren't participating into a QDIA. And so a, a qualified default investment alternative, I believe is what it stands for. Um, so if you enroll into a QDIA, the QDIA can either be a target date fund or it could be a managed account solution. Um, so either one of those two would be viable options to do that, but you could definitely do that. Okay, and we have one more question here. Is it prudent for plan sponsors to evaluate the fees of the co-fiduciary or the plan's investment advisor if they handle rollovers of retirees outside of the plan? Um, so I'm going to answer that a couple different ways, or at least break it into a couple different parts. So yes, it is definitely your responsibility as a fiduciary to make sure that the fees you're paying the plan advisor are reasonable. Right, so I think the thing to remember when you're looking at fees, and I would say this, you know, whether you're looking at plan, actual plan fees or advisor fees, whatever it may be, it, it's not about being a low-cost provider, right? That's not, that's not what the DOL is saying with the regulations as, as they're written. What they're saying is, okay, are the fees for the services you're getting reasonable? So it's about being able to go out and benchmark, you know, like to like. You know, you may have a very complicated plan, and so your advisor has to do different things. If you have multiple, let's say you have 10 payroll locations instead of one, and the advisor is going to go out and do enrollment at 10 locations versus one, well, I would submit to you that he should be charging you more money to do that because it's more work for him. And, so, and that's okay. So he doesn't have to be that low-cost provider. It's about doing that apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And there's a lot of companies out there that do that now, and I, I would encourage you to reach out to your, either your record-keeping partner or if you have an advisor, talk to your advisor about benchmarking the plan's services as well as his, as his or her own. Uh, there's a company out there, for example, called Fiduciary Benchmarks, and a lot of the record-keeping platforms you know, can get you that sort of information and that data and that report for free. Um, so definitely ask for it. It's definitely something you should be doing on a regular basis every couple years. You know, I would say, you know, in general, we always say your plan itself should go out to bid through an RFP process about every three to five years and you should be doing the benchmarking a little more frequent than that. Um, so definitely worth doing and definitely something you should do. As far as rollovers go, you know, the issue for rollovers isn't about, in my mind, it's not about compensation. It's about, the, the way the regulations are written today, if that advisor, so for example, if he's acting in a 321, he or she's acting in a 321 or a 338 capacity, you know, they really shouldn't be taking the rollover. Um, they can't be increasing their own compensation. They can't affect their own compensation. 
Now that said, I will tell you that our program, the Worksite Financial Solutions program, the way we have it structured, and we've gotten lots of different attorneys' opinions about it, um, we do have a way to allow that. We have a basically a call center in the LPL offices um, that are not, you know, they're not, we're associated with your plan, but we're not the advisor on your plan. Uh, and so these are employees that we pay a salary to. They don't get paid a commission or anything like that. Their job is to educate the participants who call in. And if and when that participant then goes ahead and makes a decision and says, you know what, I really do want to work with Joe Plan Advisor. I've known him my whole life, and he's been great. Then we go ahead and introduce and, and make that connection. Um, but there's that sort of big wall that we have in the middle. Um, you know, if your advisor is just talking to your employees and taking rollovers right from them, and he's also giving you advice on the plan, probably something you want to look at. Um, you know, I, I couldn't tell you whether it is legal or not legal, but I would tell you there's a lot of scrutiny on that side of the business right now with the, at the DOL and the SEC. So it's something to think about. Okay. Um, I think you've given us a lot to think about. That cement truck is, is looming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Adam. And thank you, audience, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we hope to see many of you at, at our upcoming Las Vegas conference, which is September the 15th at the 18th. Uh, September 15th through 18th at the Cosmopolitan. Uh, many of these fiduciary issues are going to be covered there as uh, we, we always pay attention to that particular issue. And you see on the screen before you the dates for that Las Vegas program and some of the dates for 2014. So if you can't make Las Vegas, we hope to see you in 2014. Again, thanks very much for being with us today and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>